and I'll give, I'll give a 20 minute warning, I mean a 5 minute warning. Uh, <laughs> uh, let me just uh, say a few words on each. Uh, I'm actually a little bit starstruck to be in, in introducing Professor Lim jae because uh, his work on historiography and history is really not only groundbreaking, but it actually changes some of the uh, possibilities of thinking. I think it's a great tribute to the uh, dynamic uh, integration of ethics and intellect. Uh, he, he's um, the founding director of, of the uh, Research Institute of Comparing History and Culture at Hanyang. He now teaches at Sogang University and is the um, editor of five volumes of, of Master Dictatorship in the 20th Century, which of course is now more, mm -hmm. more, more relevant than ever. Um, our second speaker will be um, uh, Ms. Jane Jin Kaisen from the Royal, uh, the Royal Academy of Denmark. Royal Academy of Denmark. Um, she was born in Jeju and then was uh, adopted in Denmark. She's an Emmet Faye from UCLA and um, and is now currently a PhD candidate for the Royal Danish Academy of Art. Uh, her video installations have been shown, video installations and, and her films have been shown in far too many um, places to uh, list here, but uh, including Lei and Samsung. And she's the founding member of the Art Collective of UFO Lab. Uh, UFO Lab. So, then uh, third, our third speaker is uh, Professor uh, Young Wu. Uh, from, he's uh, currently an assistant professor at, at the East Asian Studies Department, is that, is that right? East Asian Studies at uh, NYU. He's also affiliated, affiliated with institutions in Leiden and Singapore, and is currently rewriting his, his uh, first book, Embedded Voices Between Empires, The Cultural Formation of Korean Popular Music and uh, working on this next book project, which is called Post-War Media Escapes and the Acoustic Moderation of the East Asia. And finally, we have um, Ms. Michelle Wong, who is a, research, uh, a, a researcher at the Asian Art, uh, Art, Asia Art Archive in Hong Kong, and is currently an assistant curator at, in, uh, here at the Bang uh, Biennale. So let's, let's uh, welcome uh, Professor Lepin. Today I'm, I'm going to speak in English because so many audience actually our international team. So uh, my talk today is East Asia as an entangled memory space. So I'm going to talk about the turbulence regarding memory in East Asia. In a sense, this the turbulence regarding memory in East Asia is a very good indication to show how Asian countries are now very well connected. For example, in 1960s, 1970s, have you ever heard of any the history textual controversy in East Asia? Well, no. Means that people just, you know, they were not interested in what kind of uh, history textbooks are used in the neighboring countries. They didn't care. They were just their own interest is confined to their own history textbook in their own countries. But suddenly in 1980s, we found that people began to be interested in history textbooks used in other countries. So if you have a look at the history textbooks in 1960s and 70s in Japan, even the most liberal history textbooks are worse than today, even today's new history textbook. There is no mention about Nazi massacre, no mention about comfort women, just even in the liberal history textbooks in the 1960s, was really awful. But of course, it never means that Korean or Chinese or Taiwanese history textbooks are better than Japanese liberal textbooks. But this is another story. But what I want to say is that, so noise in regard to memories in East Asia is much better than silence. So silence never guarantees us a certain, how can I say, certain uh, peace or coexistence of certain memories but it just uh, represents a certain indifference to neighboring countries. So I think, uh, the very paradoxically, I, I see a sign of the hope or a certain optimism, optimistic future from the turbulence regarding uh, memory conflict or world memories in East Asia. It's a first step towards to making the common memory of common East Asia. So that's the, uh, the, the beginning, uh, the point of what I want to say. Oh, oh I, I don't know how to use this. 
Okay? Um, so, this is, you, many of you saw this uh, sign that this is from Gdansk, you know, the Solidarity Notions Movement of the 1980s. So I think that the exhibition which is now held in this building shows very well how this deep, the memories of different countries are well connected now beyond national borders, even regional borders. Perhaps people did not expect they can find such a solidarity notice fragments in the archive of May 18 in Gwangju. But certainly we could find some May 18 archive in the solidarity notice, you know, this bowl and from Gdansk in the Poland. So when the, I do remember, there is a one poet, Korean poet, whose name is uh, Kim myung Su. The, just immediately after the, the May 18, it was not uh, the allowed for Korean poets or for Korean intellectuals to talk of Gwangju, you know, openly, publicly. <coughs> but this Kim myung Su guy, he picked up the Solidarity Notion movement as a way of, you know, making uh, the Gwangju case public through allegory with the Solidarity Notion movement. It was say because Solidarity Notion movement was a sort of anti-communist movement, right? Polish workers strike against the communist power. So it was quite safe for Korean intellectuals to talk about the Polish workers' rebellion on rising because it is anti-communist, right? These are rising against communist power. So this is, a, in a sense, the Solidarity Notion gave us a certain room for maneuvering to talk of Gangju in indirect way. So when I found this uh, yesterday, I it just it reminded me of this Kim Young Su guy, the, the poet who made an allegory of this Guangzhou through the uh, the, the Solidarity Notion movement in Poland. Also, the Polish history is my main field, so I was really, you know, impressed by this. And second one is this, you know, Rwanda. You know. The, certainly here in the, uh, the May 8th archive, you could find a certain uh, work done by the Rwanda refugee. So it means that Gwangju, of course, the, the May 18th Gwangju, has never ever been connected with the genocide in Rwanda in the course of history. But certainly they are interconnected through the memory, right? That's why I use the term of entangled memory. So I mean that instead of entangled history, now the world are entangled through the memories. So Rwanda people and also the, for example, when you have a look at the uh, comfort women case, certainly uh, you can find the comfort women uh, became a global issue in, in the year 2000. Why? I think that because the sexual violence, sexual crime in former Yugoslavia made the whole world awaken to the sexual violence and sexual crime, and in a sense it has led this comfort women issue into a global one. So when you have a look at this, uh, uh, the International Women's Tribunal, which was held at Tokyo, you can find judges came from the uh, tribunal of former Yugoslavia, the war crime. And the prosecutors also, they were experienced in that the former Yugoslavia war crimes tribunal. Means that through this way of coming to terms with the past of those different crimes and genocide, suddenly their memory came to be connected. Right? So this, this is the same thing happened in East Asia and even the same thing happened between East Asian countries and the other the extra Asian countries, non-Asian countries. So this is really does fit in very well this concept of this forum, the wild, wild connectivity. I think that wild connectivity is a little bit too modest expression. Very well connected, they are really very well connected in the realm of memories. So people do. And this one is, yes, this is a Mexican this, uh, collaborative work. So I, I just, you know, I, I, I paid a visit here yesterday uh, the, without recognizing our session will be held here. <laughs> so I took some photos and then suddenly I found, okay, I can put these photos into the, my PPT presentation because it is a very good indication to show 
how those people were are connected through the memory of the atrocities of the past genocide, past crimes. And then, yes. so this is called uh, this uh, how, how can the connectivity of the different walls through the memories is defined by a some protocol scholars internal globalization uh, because it means that the, the memories became to be entangled beyond national borders and the, like this exhibition in this in this building and the, we can call this uh, transnational memory culture or global collective memory cosmopolitan memory or multi-directional memories all those things are this metaphor to depict how the world are connected through the memories and the, uh, regardless of whether they were really connected in the course of, course of the history, they were not connected in the course of history, right? But through the memories, they came to be connected very well. And then they came to reference each other. So cross-referencing. Cross For example, without referencing Holocaust nowadays, it's very difficult to talk of you know, different genocides. For example, Nazi massacre. Iris Chang, so her subtitle was Forgotten Holocaust, right? If, even the ultra right wing of Polish, uh, uh, ultra right wing intellectuals who regards uh, that the Polish nation was the main victim by Nazis instead of Jews, they also used the, the term of Forgotten Holocaust. Means that actually it was Poles who were, who were massacred by, by Nazis, but usually people say only Jews are massacred by Nazis. So they called it even Holocaust deniers in Poland, sort of, they are using the term of forgotten Holocaust to depict they were victimized by the Nazis. So it means that the, this sort of self-referencing of genocide and the you know, massacres and Holocaust came, uh, became very popular in uh, making um, Nemoscape in the different parts of the world. And also, this means that the, uh, the, our remembrance or our memory came to be extraterritorialized instead of uh, uh, the, I mean, the uh, nationalized memory, right? So in a sense, we can find uh, certain traces of how these collective national memories came to be extraterritorialized or deterritorialized. De and then escape from the national memories and national collective memories. But of course, of course, on the other hand, uh, there are uh, lots of examples to show that a uh, nationalist re-territorialization of memories are, over, uh, are on the surface. Actually, as uh, Ekaterina yesterday uh, talked of several very, very interesting examples in German case, in European case, and then mainly this is, you know, I think that after the after the fall of Berlin Wall, certain there one can witness a certain shift of memory, memory culture from the hero ship to victim. So suddenly a emergence of global memory space or global memory regime or global public sphere, in a sense, helped to make victim as a key word in the, any collective memory. Means that Okay, if the world recognizes our nation as victims, then we can get a certain empathy or sympathy from the, from the world, world opinion or something like that. So we need to stress, we need to put stress on the, the, our experience of being victimized by other guys. So even all the, all the perpetrators now became victims in their memories. It's a pretty, it's, oh, we were the first victim by the atomic bombing. Right? And they forgot the, anyway, any, the, the, the massacres they had done in 19 in China or any, any Asian countries, and even Nazi, even Germans, they said, oh, we were the Hitler's first victims. <laughs> and Austrians and the Germans are fighting for the position of who was the first victims by Hitler. Right? So this sort of a very distasteful competition over who suffered most is quite prevalent in the global memory space. And sometimes it is related with the numbering, politics of numbering, okay? How many people were dead in your country? For example, the uh, Irish Chang always numbered uh, 300,000, the, the, the numbers for, for dead in the Nanjing. 
But this is really delicate because if one uh, the uh, the tooth, the numbers of victims in Nagasaki and Hiroshima, it is slightly less than uh, 300,000. So certainly in this context, we can find 300,000 becomes a very significant meaning. And then you know, num number, number of the dead killed in Poland, for example, you used to say that we owe oh, 6 million, but now 5.3 million Poles. But among 5.3 million Poles, the 3 million were Jews, Polish Jews. Means that if one the uh, changes numbers of dead Poles during the Second World War from 6 million to 5.3 million, means that Jews were more killed, killed more than Poles. That's important. So there was very sharp debate about the number, of how many people were dead during the Second World War. So for us, for me, at least, it doesn't make any big difference between 5.3 million people or 6 million people. So many people were killed and dead. But sometimes in the realm of the memory, the historians begin to argue about the number of the dead people. It's a very, very dark. Politics of numbering can be found in the memory and history. So in this sense, Holocaust, genocide, death massacres, and sexual violence, all those things actually in the, uh, in the, in the memory, in the of the world, is really very closely related with this, especially when these memories uh, come to be involved in the re-territorialization or re-nationalization of memories by putting on stress on the victims, like this. So, I mean, as I said, this actually history textbooks in today's Japan is much better than 1960s, 70s uh, history textbooks, even the most liberal history textbooks in Japan. Means that, so I think that the history textbooks did not get worse, but our sensibilities of the neighboring country's memory become more how can I say, more, more sensitive or more acute. So that's why we now are very, very uh, swiftly respond to the history textbooks in neighboring countries. And on the other hand, also a very, very good thing is that Koreans, or some Koreans began to reflect their own history textbooks. For example, when the uh, Atarashi Rekishi uh, uh, Show issue appeared on the scene in the 2001, Sankei Shinbun, who is a support of this uh, right-wing history, revisionist history textbook in Japan, uh, made a special issue, special columns, uh, the, uh, dedicated to the analysis of history textbooks in China and Korea and other Asian countries. And that the uh, Sankei Shinbun correspondent wrote uh, two articles uh, in analyzing Korean history textbooks. And his conclusion me means that, let's learn from Korean history textbooks. Because without any restrictions, without any lingering Korean history textbooks put an emphasis to bring the readers a love for their own country, patriotism is the real thing, real aim that any history textbook should do. But even the Japanese writing history textbook did not dare to bolster patriotism, love for their own country like Korean history textbook. So, so they were really jealous of Korean history textbooks. So, I mean, this sort of very interesting how can it connect it between different parts of the uh, different uh, contents, of course, the argument is quite opposite, but the narrative and grammar inherent to these different history textbooks are not the same, right? So in this sense, the Japanese history textbook uh, has led me, at least me, to reflect on Korean history textbook per se. So I counted even the certain collective subject in, 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 in the practice, two practice, I mean, we with a nation, with a country. In the Korean history textbook, I could find more than 20. But in the Japanese right-wing regional history textbook, I could find only one. Means that, oh, yes, yes, perhaps Japanese right-wing historians would be very much jealous of this Korean history textbook. But Korean historians just respond to Japanese history textbooks. Oh, they are just distorting truths and history, while we Korean history textbooks are keeping history truth. 
I don't think so. So in this sense, a disconnected world gives us a second thought to our own history textbook, to our own monoscape in Korea. Right? So all those things is about this and then. Actually, I mean this certain uh, emergence of the critical memory in uh, East Asia uh, was actually related with the anti-Vietnamese war, anti-war campaign in Vietnam, just in Europe too. I think that this uh, Honda Kassit, he was the war correspondent of San, the, the, the Asai Shimbun in Vietnam. And he used to write reports on the uh, American atrocities in Vietnam. So thank you, no, not thank you. Asai Shinbun. And then in his practice of the, that book, the Chugok uh, Kuntabi, he wrote explicitly, while I was reflecting on the American atrocities in Vietnam, I came to a thought, how did the Japanese army behave in China? So that's why he started the journey through the uh, China along the route of Japanese invasion. And this, this is the uh, how can I skip of kicking off the Japanese dome on Japanese memories of Nanjing massacre, and then it, it was a start of a very really hot argument, hot debate on the Nanjing massacre in Japan. But without the Vietnam War, without the anti anti war campaign in Vietnam, so it would, would be quite difficult for, for those Hunnahazi to think of Nanjing massacre that Japanese army perpetrated in Vietnam. Also, I think that the Butland process, Citizens Tribunal, and then Jean Paul Sartre's uh, the, uh, awakening of the French colonialism against Algeria, the National Liberation Front. Actually, when the Jean Paul Sartre was invited to Russell's Citizen Committee, he was uh, thinking of the you know, American atrocities in, in Vietnam. But before Americans, it was French army. So without mentioning French, French, you know, colonial atrocities in Vietnam and in Nigeria, he could not write anything about uh, the uh, American atrocities in Vietnam. So uh, in a sense, anti anti war campaign in Vietnam was a really, really uh, certain, how can I say, watershed in the leading the world memories, global memories into a very critical world. Even in the United States, many of Jewish students involved in the anti war campaign in Vietnam because they thought, oh, it is sort of, you know, how can I say, sort of Holocaust. Sort of Holocaust is done in Vietnam in Asian countries by colonialism. So post-colonial understanding of Holocaust, in a sense, uh, you know, had its origin in this anti-war campaign in Vietnam. And then, yes, and also, it is very interesting. If you have a look at the uh, genocide convention, Right? That was done, uh, the, written by the Lenkin, who is a Polish Jew. And then it was, uh, you know, when it was passed in the UN Convention, do you know who was the first group who responded to Lenkin's Genocide Convention? It was uh, African American Communist Group. They, they wrote a We Charge Genocide, it's a booklet, to criticize slavery. Slavery was, uh, you know, sort of, how can I say? It's the first genocide that was done uh, by the American, no, the European colonialism, uh, even before the, 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 the Holocaust. And then, you know, Du Bois, W.B. Du Bois, he wrote a very, very interesting fragment on the uh, Warsaw Ghetto. Okay. After having participated in the conference in Moscow, he came on the way to back to the United States. He dropped by uh, the Warsaw very intentionally. It was 1948-49. And he visited the ghetto, Warsaw ghetto, ruins of Warsaw ghetto. And there he wrote that, oh, I could hear screams of the African-American slaves from Warsaw ghetto. So in this way, he, you know, in a sense, instinctively or intuitively, he could find a connectivity between Holocaust and American slavery. So in this way, in people's remembering, in people's ways of remembering, certain different parts of genocide began to be connected in the realm of memory. So that's what I wanted to say today. 
through the uh, cases of East Asia, but actually it is uh, beyond, beyond the regional boundaries. All those different memories are now beginning to be intermixed and connected. For example, when the Japanese government and Korean government had uh, signed a very that weird agreement to just silence the memory of comfort women, and one American columnist in Bloomberg, uh, Bloomberg uh, wrote explicitly, okay, we should broaden this comfort women issue into the, into the, uh, uh, the uh, human trafficking crimes and also the female slavery by the ISIS and the uh, Harabokong. So, I mean, nowadays people really began to, uh, began to cross-reference the certain uh, memories of the genocide and massacres and the human tragedies in a totally different part of the world. So I think that we can call it really an internal globalization. Our memories came to be connected very, very closely, much more closely than we have thought, we have expected before. So that's the main point. Do I have other Yes, I mean, the, this sort of memory confluence of the Holocaust, Rwanda genocide, ethnic cleansing of former Yugoslavia, comfort women, human trafficking, sexual slavery by the I ISIS, and so on in the global memory space. So comfort women came. It's, it's also <coughs> actually in the uh, Dutch, Dutch uh, the court, immediately after the Second World War in the Jakarta or Hatabaya, Something like that. Actually, they committed some Japanese who were in charge of comfort women cases. So it was 1946 or 47. But this is very weird. Actually, those uh, the white uh, Dutch colonialists were really angry at this uh, racial transgression done, done by the Japanese army. How on earth can you Asian guys exploit our white women? This sort of racial, the anger at the racial transgression was the promoter of this, you know, convicting those Japanese for the comfort of women of the Dutch women, right? But, but the, in the other cases, all the silence had, had been kept till 1991, and the Kimaksu just, you know, complex. So, it's really, really interesting and interviewing examples we can find from the realm of global memory space and to show how those critical memories were once on past, national past or regional past, began to be connected. And I think this is a good promoter. So, top notes regarding the memories, I think it's okay. It's much better than silence, right? At least we can recognize. The uh, neighboring countries uh, collect memories. What kind of memory uh, memories should we keep, right? So, oh, this is uh, um, in the uh, in 2011 December. There was a very interesting uh, meeting of Co former Korean comfort women and Holocaust survivors at the Queensboro Community College in New York City. So it's, it was organized by the Korean American Civic Empowerment and Cooper Protocol Center. This is very delicate. So when usually when the Korean memory activist of comfort women goes to the United States and they, they have a hold of the press conference, they used to have this in the Jewish Cultural Center in any small town. So they really want to appeal to American audience who are quite ignorant of East Asian history, but who knows Holocaust very well. So they are using the uh, Holocaust as a leverage to remind American audience who are ignorant of East Asian history, oh, look how terrible they were, right? This sort of, it's in between the uh, extraterritorialization and re-territorialization of conflicting memories and the in between we can find. So I had an interview with these activists the Korean Civil Empowerment Group, and there is a very interesting also episode. When the, in the California area, they want to erect this, you know, Comfort Women Monument there, and then the mayor of that small town was an Armenian-American. 
as the decoded activists began to 